Well, welcome to The After Show, the show where we explore the message behind the message. I'm Michael Grove. I'm here with Pastor Jeff Sandstrom today. Hey, wherever you're at, if you'll do me a favor, make sure you subscribe wherever you're listening or watching. That way you can keep up to date to all these shows as they come out. Pastor Jeff, how are you doing today? I'm feeling great, Pastor Michael. Thanks for asking. Hey, you did a phenomenal job this weekend as we talked about the end in mind. Now, we are trying to learn to live the, the best life possible that Jesus would have for us. Can you help me just think through this for a second? Why is it so impossibly hard to always live with the end in mind? That's a really good question. Um, I think it's difficult for us sometimes to live with the end in mind because we're so absorbed with the here and now. I mean, when it comes, I mean, even with what Pastor Marty talked about last week with judging others, we, we do it all the time, whether we're uh, hurt by a family member or somebody takes the parking spot that we were about to pull into. You know what I mean? Like we, we just judge people all the time because we're so consumed with the here and now. Um, the good thing about keeping the end in mind is, I mean, not necessarily about making people scared because someday, you know, uh, we're going to leave this world and we better, we're going to give an, I mean, all that is good, but they have a different perspective. Like this isn't all there is. There's more. We're here for like just a blip on the radar screen. It's not, it's not a whole lot of time. So making the most of it matters. Thinking with the end in mind, what this is really all about will cause us to forgive a family member that's hurt us really bad mm -hmm. or shake off someone who pulls into a parking spot before we do. And, you know, I mean, people have gotten I've actually done that before. I, I didn't mean to, but I guess somebody was waiting for a parking spot at the grocery store, and I pulled into it, and they got out of the car. They started cussing and swearing at me, and I'm like, I'm so sorry. I didn't realize that you were waiting. I just pulled around the aisle, and it was open, and I pulled in, and then um, the guy parked, and as he, he came up to me, and I was like, is he going to fight me? What's going to He's like, hey, I'm really sorry. I don't really know what came over. I'm just having a bad day, and I was like, Oh, thank God. You know, like, I didn't know what was going to happen. But I mean, that's just a, a good picture of how, man, we're so involved in the here. I mean, did it take an extra 10, 15 seconds to walk a couple extra spots? Or, you know what I'm saying? So like keeping the end in mind makes um, our life better. It makes other people's lives better. Even if they don't believe, it just, it makes the world uh, a better place. And I'm convinced that it's a better way to live. Yeah, that's so good. You know what? I think we're by nature, very egocentric people. Um, and, and actually, I think God created us. You mean to, me and you or just like people in general? Uh, not you, but everybody <laughs> else and especially me. You know, and I think God somewhat created us with the um, desire and the ability to fight for ourselves, to make sure we're going to be okay. He's yep. like given us some of that into our personality already. Yeah. Um, but I'm also a big believer in practice makes perfect. Yeah. And so even when it comes to something like this, I think we can practice having the end in mind in order to get that to be a lifestyle and a mentality. What, what are some things that come off um, the top of your head right now that you can say, here's a great way to practice living with the end in mind? Yeah. Um, I mean, <laughs> trying hard not to sound too pastoral or too Christian, uh, the first thing that comes to mind is, is just prayer, having an open conversation with God. The Bible talks about praying without ceasing which doesn't necessarily mean locking yourself in your prayer closet at all times of the day and walking around with your hands up high and just, I mean, like, yeah, but I mean, praying without ceasing, your mind is constantly going and it's constantly working. Like, you have thoughts going on all the time, whether you realize it or not. When people are like, hey, are you with me? Like, your mind was actually somewhere, your mind was still working because it never rests, right? So you can actually train your mind to always filter through the things of God. And that would be more praying without ceasing. It's so just having thoughts about people or things or things that happened yesterday or that will happen tomorrow or whatever. You can train your thoughts to be filtered through God. And that's what prayer is, it's just talking to God. So if you're able to train your mind, be renewed, um, to, to, to be transformed by the renewing of your mind, like Scripture talks about, yeah. uh, you're able to constantly pray without cease. And if you're able to do that, um, you're able to think with the end in mind because it's all about your focus and about your perspective. Right. So if we can um, have a helicopter view of uh, the world, existence of eternity, instead of just, oh, this person made me mad or I'm really hurt right now or this and that. I mean, that's what helps us get through things is realizing that we have hope, hope for tomorrow, hope that this isn't all there is, mm -hmm. that there's so much more than just meets the naked eye. Um, I would say prayer and not just praying in the morning or at night, which those things are very, very important and before meals, but praying without ceasing is a good practice to put into place to help your mind constantly like, ah, there's so much more than, is, 
like is this really are we are we really fighting about dinner right now or is this something deeper is something else going on like is is this person upsetting me because of this reason or is there something else kind of it's it's bigger than that it's yeah. bigger the perspective well, always comes back a bit further that's so good and you know i think through this um the lord's prayer and how does jesus start our father who art in heaven hallowed be thy name thy kingdom come thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven to me yep. that's jesus's moment to say this is how you start by praying align your heart with god get yourself so unfocused on yourself because we're so focused normally on ourselves that we yep. can align our hearts with what is it that god wants for today. So I love that concept. That's Start it. with prayer. Align your heart with God. Mm -hmm. That's so good. That's so good. Hey, let me ask you a few things, man. I love um, this concept that we're part of proclaiming the gospel, helping people understand the kingdom of heaven and what that looks like. You touched on that a little bit this week. Uh, and I, I just, a verse comes to mind that I love to read here. Psalm 37, three through five says, trust in the Lord and do good. Dwell on the Lord and enjoy safe pasture. Now, this is the part that I, this next part, I think we take out of context so often. Mm -hmm. It says, take the light in the Lord and he will give you the desires of your heart. I've heard that verse taken so out of context before that, man, if you just, you love God and you try to please him, he's going to give you whatever you ask for. Yeah, yeah. I don't know that that's what I read. In fact, you touched on it a lot this week. Um, once our hearts align with God, then the desires of our heart make sense for him to give us. Can you kind of like expound on that a little bit? What does that look like in me? Yeah, yeah. I think you're probably connecting that with um, when Jesus talks about on the Sermon on the Mount um, to ask, seek, and knock. And people kind of look at that passage and because he says, ask and you'll receive. Uh, anyone who asks receives, uh, seek, and you'll find, and knock and the door will be open to you. And that sounds a lot like hold on a second, did I just get a genie and a lamp? This sounds amazing. He'll give me whatever I want. And the same thing with this passage. You know, trust in the Lord and he will give you the desires of your heart. Man, my heart really desires a Lamborghini. So all I have to do is trust in the Lord and I will get this shiny car some way, somehow. And that's not exactly what the scriptures are saying, right? Like, yeah, there is a sense of like God owns all in the universe and all is at our disposal when we are in him. But it goes just a little bit further than that. When you mature in your relationship with God, um, as far as the ask, seek, knock passage goes, um, you become more in tune with who God is and you care a lot less about that Lamborghini car and you care more about the millions of people that are starving because they haven't eaten in seven days. Mm. You care a lot more about the people that will die because they don't have clean drinking water. You care a lot more about the fact that there's a big difference between the way the world is and the way that it should be. And you want to do something to help that. And with this passage, when you trust in the Lord, he will give you the desires of your heart. It doesn't necessarily mean that, okay, if I just trust God, I'll get the car. That's, that, that's probably a gross interpretation. You're right. Sometimes with scriptures, we take it out of context because we don't look at it um, as far as what's in front of it and what's behind it. And we don't look at it within the context of the entire book and where it fits in the library of the entire canon, the Bible itself. But when you look at just that scripture and what surrounds it, it talks a lot more about um, when you trust in God, not so much will he give you what's already in your heart, but when you trust him, you give him your heart. And then he is the one that places things in there, like making the world a better place, which is what this is all about. Wow. Wow. What would you say is God's number one desire then if you were to, if we're going to align our hearts with him and want the things that he wants, what is his number one desire? His number one desire is that people would find their way back to him. Uh, he loves his creation so much that I'm sure God's desire is, I mean, that's why we've been endowed with the, the great commission is to go into the world and make disciples. The Bible says that our job is to make disciples and he'll build the church. Mm -hmm. So what we do is we just, uh, we grow closer to God and we share that with other people. We share our testimony with people who God is and what God is all about. And that's, that's the mission. That's kind of what this is all about. So when we talk about heaven and earth and all this kind of stuff, yeah, someday uh, heaven is going to collide with earth and all things are going to be made brand new. And that's the joy of it. We get to participate. Sometimes God wants to use us in order to bring heaven to earth. And we get, we get little pictures of this here and there, right? Like every time you feed the homeless or when you give or when uh, reconciliation takes place between relationships, I mean, these are moments when heaven touches earth because it's the Jesus story. 
reconciliation, restoration, all these things coming to, like, uh, it's justice coming to, like, all of this is part of heaven. That's what this is all about. So there are moments when, you know, your, your heart beats faster and, like, time stands still, and there's just a moment, and it's not just, like, um, a, a holiday movie. It's just, like, moments in real life when you're, like, this must be what life is all about. Yeah, there are moments when heaven touches earth, and someday that will be the constant. That will be always, all the time. And until then, God wants to use us in order to bring heaven to earth. And I think that's one of the most exciting things about the mission of God. Wow. So in that, you would say um, all of us then have a part to play inside of bringing that, that presence of the Lord here for the other people. Absolutely. Absolutely. Everybody plays a part. God can use anything and anyone, and he has all throughout scripture. Um, God is always speaking. I think the question is whether or not we're listening. Wow. Wow. You know, Pastor Jeff, you know me, and you know one of my favorite verses, Ephesians 2.10, your God's workmanship created in Christ Jesus to do great things which he prepared for you in advance to do. Um, you talked a lot about the creator, um, his ability to work with the materials that um, that we can represent ourselves as. I love that thought that we're either working with the creator or we're causing things to be more difficult uh, for the creator to use us. Mm -hmm. um, and I always want to make sure that I'm in a spot that, okay, if I'm God's workmanship, I want to work the way he designed me to work. What does it look like for us to really submit and to say, God, whatever you want to do in and through me, have your way. What, what would that look like for somebody to be able to do? Yeah. Um, Good question. It looks a lot probably like being Christ-like, um, being like Christ, being like Jesus. And what he did is he died. Mm. Um, and I think that's probably one of the most difficult things for us to do, especially like because you mentioned we're pretty egocentric. Um, we can be pretty uh, uh, self-absolved, um, self-absorbed. And so for us to die to ourselves is, is pretty difficult because we have our plans, we have our futures, we have all this stuff. Like, and we should. God's put that in us to be, you know, planners and to make way for new things, and we, which is all good. But sometimes we get so wrapped up in ourselves, I think it might be beneficial for our spirit to completely put all that aside and just die to ourselves and say, okay, God, I make my plans, but you order my steps. And I will place all that in your hands and I will do what you want. I'll go where you want me to go. I'll be what you want me to be. Forget my plans. May they be yours. Which kind of ties back into the verse that you were talking about. Trust in the Lord and then he will give you the desires that will be placed in your heart. Wow. Wow. You know, and you started with it being Christ-like. You know, when we think of that picture being fully God yet humbled himself to even death on a cross. Yep. Um, I even think through the very natural side of him in the garden praying, if there's any other way, Father, knowing yeah. he was going to be separated from his heavenly Father, knowing you would have that, that moment of darkness, if, there, if there's any other way, let it be. But not my will, but your will be done. Hey, Pastor Jeff, I think sometimes yeah. we all think of ourselves more than other people. It's just a natural part of life, right? Absolutely. We're very egocentric as people. Yep. Um, and it becomes easy for us to want what we want instead of wanting what God wants. Is there, a, sure. is there a moment that you can think of right now where you're like, yep, I messed that one up. I definitely was more concerned <laughs> with myself than what God wanted. Are you asking if I have failures in my life? Yes, Pastor Michael, I do. <laughs> okay, I'm not. I don't want you to give us like your I'm deepest, just, darkest failures. But no, I, can you just kidding. share a story with us? Because I know some people struggle with this. Like, man, sure. I don't mean to be selfish. It's just you know, Paul even says that. Why do I do the things I don't want to do and the things I want to do? I can't get myself to do. And absolutely, it's the struggle. So I can mean, you just share with us? Just, I have a library of moments. Um, there was a time when. Uh, after college, um, Erica and I were dating and I was like, this is the girl I'm going to marry. And so we had conversations about, you know, what future together would look like. I had graduated um, and I went to Berkeley, California um, as a church planter and we were not together. So I moved there by myself. And so we were talking on the phone and um, talking about marriage. And so I just said, you know, how is this, you know, either we're going mean, to, stupid in hindsight. Yes, I know. But I was like, Hey, Erica, either you're going to move to Berkeley, California, and we're going to be together, or we're just not going to be together. In my mind, that made logical sense because I'm in Berkeley, California with a job. She was still in school. 
if she's going to be with me, she's going to come with me, right? I mean, that just makes sense. To her, it sounded like I was giving her an ultimatum, which was a bad decision. And I didn't understand. We were just misunderstanding. But I was focused on me. This is my life, and this is what I'm doing. So if you want to come along for the ride, this is what we'll this is, this is where we're going. And uh, I didn't understand until later how badly that sounded and how much I wouldn't want to hear that. And so after uh, prayer, reflection, and some godly counsel, uh, I went back to her and uh, I just said, hey, look, um, you can be in school and we can plant a church in Berkeley, California. You can be in school or we can plant a church anywhere else in the United States. Or you can be in school and I'll get a job flipping burgers at McDonald's. I just want to be with you. Wow. And uh, that was a moment where uh, I realized that maybe instead of, um, you know, making my wife follow me wherever I go, maybe maybe I could follow her. Maybe that might be a good way to kind of turn, um, turn the corner a little bit. Funny thing is, after we had that conversation, uh, she ended up coming to Berkeley, California. So sometimes it's just... I think all about being on the same page uh, w w with God and treating people the way that you would want to be treated rather than you making your own way and kind of pulling people along for the ride. That's so funny. And if you think about the fact that that was somebody you love and are close to, how much easier is it to do that to the people around us that maybe don't even mean that much or we, we're insignificant in our mind? It's so easy to walk over them, isn't it? I'm sure that we do that and we don't even realize it and somebody once said as far as leadership goes um you don't look at how people treat people who can do something for them the real leadership comes from how people treat those that uh, um not are beneath them but uh, um, that can't do anything for them wow. yeah. i want to ask you um a little bit about the holy spirit's role inside of this one of my favorite uh chapters in the bible is romans 8 and you know it starts out with paul addressing the fact that the earth itself has been condemned because of man's sin. Uh, if you remember in the book of Genesis, and I'm not reminding you, I'm just saying um, in the book of Genesis chapter three, we find out that the earth itself is cursed because of man's sin, and it would be hard to produce from it. It's, it's going to mm -hmm. cause labor pains. And it's going to cause all sorts of things. Well, when we get to Romans eight, I love this concept that um, Paul says the earth is crying out with pains like in labor to be restored because of the sin that has happened on this earth. This thing sin, not the action of sin, this thing sin that's all around it right this moment. Yeah. Um, and it's crying out wanting to be restored. And then he talks about the fact that you and I also, um, we cry out when we don't know what to say with words that we don't even understand when our hearts align with those things, wanting to see things restored as well. Um, I think of earthquakes, I think of volcanoes, I think of all these natural things as the earth saying, I want to be restored, I want to be made new. And then I think that when Paul says, we also cry out, that's him saying, the Holy Spirit inside you is going to direct you in the same way to cry out for the things of this world to be made new again, to be restored. Can you kind of touch on that a little bit? What's the Holy Spirit doing to activate God's people to want to see the world restored around us? Yeah. Um, can I'm sorry. Can you ask the question again in a different way? I think I understand, but I just want to make sure. Yeah. So how is the Holy Spirit um, pulling and empowering and emboldening God's people to do those things, to want to see the world restored, to want to see right happen and see justice happen. What's what's the Holy Spirit's role inside of that? And how maybe how do we how do we have the Holy Spirit fill us with the power to do those things? Yeah, yeah, that's that's a really good uh, really good question. When it comes to the Holy Spirit, I think uh, maybe the most misunderstood part of the Trinity, like it's all God, right? Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. Um, some uh, fellowships, denominations don't even touch the Holy Spirit because it's so, I, I don't understand what it is. And some people have, you know, gross interpretations, and that's just what they are, interpretations. We uh, would believe that the Holy Spirit is an extremely important part of the Trinity of God, um, mostly because he, uh, he empowers us, right? Uh, it says to go into the world and make disciples, and when the Holy Spirit comes upon you, you will receive this power, um, and so when the Holy Spirit comes upon people who are believers, you do receive power. And uh, we believe that there's an initial physical evidence of this when it comes to speaking in tongues. And I think you kind of touched on that when it comes to these moanings and groanings, that, words that we don't even understand. 
um, sometimes the Spirit of God prays through us when we don't have words, we just have feelings and we just have emotions. We don't even have the words to say, but He prays through us, um, which is uh, a phenomenal experience. If, uh, if people out there have never experienced it before, pray for that. Pray for the baptism in the Holy Spirit. Um, the, the Bible says that when the Spirit comes upon you, you receive power to be witnesses. And Samaria and Judea, you know, the ends of the earth, the, the point is to be a witness. So you can tell people what Jesus has done in your life, but there's something about it when you receive a certain kind of power that connects your spirit to someone else's and a portal is opened and their heart is vulnerable, ready to receive whatever it is that God has for them. And they may be in such a position to be extremely easy for them to cross over and say, I want to find my way back to God. I want to come to know Jesus Christ as my personal Lord and Savior. And as far as the Spirit's job in all this, I think you kind of hit on it in Genesis 1 and 2. Uh, where people's theology begins matters. Um, and I think, unfortunately, a lot of people's theology starts in Genesis 3 because that's when sin enters the world. And so the theology becomes, I am bad, get sin out of me so that I can be good, um, which is probably a gross interpretation. If we start our theology back to the beginning of the Bible, which would be Genesis chapter 1, uh, the idea would be for the Holy Spirit to tell us who we were created to be which is much different than get the sin out of me. You're not telling people they're bad and they're wrong and that they're, they're, they're flawed and that something's bad about them. You're telling them who they are. And in telling them who they are, this perfect craftsmanship that God has put with them and together, th that does the work all in and of itself. Because I think Genesis 3 theology is probably incomplete. And Genesis 1 theology is more speaking over people who they are, and that is the job of the Holy Spirit. Wow, and so he gives us the insight for those things yes. um, to be able to see people that way, because I think we also, what you're saying, we see people as flawed anyway, and so so hard for us to align with, no, God has a plan for them, God loves them. Mm -hmm. You know, and a lot of this um, thinking with the end in mind, you talked about this weekend, Pastor Marty talked about, if you didn't get to listen to that message, please go back, it was phenomenal about judging others. And he talks about the fact, and you also talked about the fact, we have to do unto others as they would have them do unto us. So we have to start with this premise of they might be flawed, but they're still meant to be good beings that God designed with a purpose and a plan. And if we can view people that way, it's going to change the way we respond to them. Is that right? Yeah, we're made in his image. Yeah, amen. That's who we are. We're children of the most high God. Uh, we're not bad and need to get the bad out so that we can become good. Sin has entered this world and it's corrupted us to our core. So we need to be reminded of who we were intended to be. Wow. Wow. Pastor Jeff, we're almost out of time here. I think through social media right now and, you know, it's such a, um, a, a spot and a platform to promote yourself, to look at yourself, to you know, put yourself out there. What would you say to somebody maybe as a practice or something that can practically get them from this spot of being so self-focused? And I, we don't intend to do that. I don't think anybody says, today I'm going to be self-focused. I think it's just natural, right? Yeah, right, sure. What's, what's a practice you can maybe give somebody? I, I even think, especially for our young adults, such a hard world right now to navigate as everything's happening on a social platform. Is there some, some sort of advice you might give them uh, when it comes to the social world, the social platform world, uh, that can encourage them today to put others first, to do something that's going to promote others and help them and bless them? Yeah, yeah, it's a, it's a really good question. Um, I, you know, I'm, I'm not a psychiatrist when it comes to social media or anything. I, I don't know if there's anything wrong with, you know, kids <clears throat> posting a selfie or anything like that. I don't want to condemn anybody. But at the same time, I think it probably is smart to take a look inside of uh, one's motives and one's heart. And it's not meant to be a guilt trip or anything, but um, if you feed yourself more um, self-indulgence, um, you end up on kind of what we talked about, uh, a, a wide road that leads to destruction. Mm -hmm. um, and like I said, I don't think there's anything wrong with a selfie. I'm not here to, you know, condemn that e even a little bit. Um, but on the other side, um, you know, I think uh, w one of the things I say uh, to myself before I, I preach or speak or teach or run a meeting or anything is uh, how through this can I make much of Jesus? Mm. And it would be a great thing to ask, uh, you know, when it comes to social media posts, how can I make much 
of Jesus, even through this. There's nothing wrong with, uh, you know, I mean, everybody has a social media account and it's not their real life, even mine. Like what people see and what people follow, that's, it's not my real life. Nobody sees the fights I have with my wife. Nobody sees um, the bad phone calls I have if people complain about. Nobody sees all that. Everybody sees highlights of stuff, so it's not real. Never compare your life to other people's highlights. You will end up completely depressed. But if you can use it as a tool to help turn people, help turn their eyes towards Jesus, mm. then do it. Amen. Do it. Amen. Pastor Jeff, really appreciate you being here. Thank you for your message this weekend. I feel like you you're bet. so great at always living out what you're talking about, thinking of the end in mind and thinking through how does your life affect other people. So thank you for that example. You bet. Thanks, Pastor Michael. Hey, this has been awesome. I'm so glad you joined us um, again. Just want to remind you, any platform you're on right now, make sure you subscribe so that you can keep up to date on all of these messages. Go back and watch last week with Pastor Marty if you haven't had a chance to see that yet. Otherwise, thank you for joining us. Happy Thanksgiving, and we will see you again next week. Thank you.